thanks everyone for joining the workshop, by the way. So this is going to be really good. Um, so Bo will kind of walk through the deck. And then if you have any kind of questions, um, you know, feel free to send those in the chat. And then we'll try to uh, kind of leave the end for a group kind of Q&A where you can come on and ask. So if that sounds good. Yeah, cool. Uh, let me just pull some things here. Two screens. I want to make sure that I'm not like showing you the side of my head this entire time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess to, to kick things off, um, my name's Bo Wright. I work for Stripe. Um, I work on the uh, startups segment. And so I work primarily with some of our newest users, kind of up and coming, um, high growth potential and, and um, working on very exciting products. Um, been at Stripe for a little more than two years, actually two years and 15 days. Um, and so in that time, I've seen a lot of different users, a lot of different examples, and, and I've had uh, a lot of these types of conversations. And, and certainly marketplaces is one of the, the very exciting aspects of um, kind of the future of our economy. And obviously Stripe has been part of that. Um, I wanna make this somewhat processor agnostic. Um, I want to answer questions that you have about your marketplace specifically and some of the things that kind of you're thinking about as you start growing and scaling. Um, while I do work on the sales team, this is not a sales pitch. This is more to help you answer questions um, and, and get the information that you need about, uh, about building your marketplace. So that's a little bit about me. Um, any questions before we, we start jumping in? I think uh, let's, let's do it. All right. Can everybody see the uh, growing marketplaces slide here? Yeah. yeah, gotcha. Awesome. Great. All right. So to start, really what we're going to talk about is two things. One is the buyer experience and the seller experience and the importance of those two things. So probably 15 minutes, I'm going to go through some slides and kind of share some examples and kind of talk through how we look at it um, and, you know, how that can over, that can impact your overall health and kind of the future of your marketplace. And then we'll get into some more details as far as you know what you need to consider from a compliance standpoint and some of the other next level aspects um, that you should start thinking about as you're building a marketplace. Um, but again, I, I don't necessarily want to be talking the whole time. So if you have questions, feel free to stop me, um, ask, ask what you need. Um, as you're all aware, the reason that you got into building a marketplace is that this represents a tremendous uh, opportunity for the future. Um, you know, we have seen a tremendous amount of growth from marketplaces specifically, and this is only going to continue. Um, you know, when you talk about um, some of the more well-known VC companies out there and, and some of the VC partners, marketplaces are definitely on that list of very, very hot topics. Investors want to get in um, because it presents an opportunity on both the buy side and the sell side. Um, and so, as you're aware, this is this is ex exciting. Um, and so, you know, we we really want to be there to help. And, and as you kind of build out your platform, there are a few things that you really need to consider and you really need to think about um, when you when you build this. Um, the first is building supply. Who are your sellers? How do you want that experience to be for your sellers? Um, what are some of the things you want to offer your sellers? What is the value of uh, your platform to your sellers? How easy on, this, on the, the other side of that, how easy is it for customers to buy from your sellers? You know, what is their experience like? How do you localize that? And as you think about kind of scaling internationally, what are some of the things that you may or may not consider as you're building out your idea and you're kind of iterating on this, these first phases? Uh, but how do you think about European customers, APAC customers, LATAM, how, how do you bring everybody into the platform so that everything is moving smoothly um, and you as the marketplace are actually protected? Uh, so we'll start on the, the supply side. And really there are a few important things to consider um, when, when building the, the supply side here. It takes time and it's important to be very, very focused when you're starting out. Um, Eventbrite, Amazon, Etsy, they didn't start as Amazon, Eventbrite, and Etsy. They started as very focused, specific marketplaces that did a, 
a, a singular thing very, very well. Whether that was bringing people together, whether that was selling books, it's hard to believe that that's where that got started, um, or you know, actually just curating craft uh, craftspeople. Um, they all started with a core model and they all started with a very specific focus of what they wanted to offer. And that was what they wanted to offer both the sellers, but also the buyers. It wasn't something that it kind of got out of hand too quickly. And they were very disciplined in, in their initial growth strategy. Um, we have conversations a lot where it can be very exciting. The amount of software tools and the amount of I, uh, options out there for marketplaces today can get a little overwhelming. So it's important to maintain that focus whenever you're building your buy side uh, and the supply side. You wanna think about what this means from a, a marketing and sales perspective and how you target those sellers, how you build the community and how you create that buyer and seller loop. Um, referrals are the lifeblood and your customers, ultimately the merchants selling on your marketplace are how you succeed and how you actually continue to grow successfully. And so by focusing on that and focusing on what the, the experience is like for your suppliers, for your merchants, um, is going to help drive more business uh, than having a wide array of options and having a wide array of solutions out there. So being very focused and being very targeted and, and working with your, your initial users is gonna be uh, very, very helpful in your initial growth. Um, as you think about bringing them onto your platform, what is that experience actually going to, to look like? And some of the things that a lot of marketplaces overlook and kind of forget about is showing things like a progress bar. How much more does your merchant, does your seller have to go through in order to um, actually complete the onboarding process? You know, some formatting options can actually impact your conversion rate quite a bit. Um, how do you localize for, for language as you think about expanding globally? Um, there are very minor decisions that you can make as you think about bringing additional suppliers on that can have quite a big impact. Uh, and as you focus on conversion, these are some of those things that you want to take into consideration. Um, when we think about compliance, and we'll get into that in just a little bit, but it's important that you make sure you take care of that and that you are remaining compliant. And, and this helps that process. You need to convey to them that we want this to be secure. We want this to be consistent. But it's very, very important that you go through this process. And so some of the formatting options and, and, um, and items that you can include in this onboarding process have a, an impact on that. You know, Again, being able to localize in that native language helps you uh, scale. Um, one of the things that you need to make a decision on is payout timing and how you actually get money to your suppliers. Typically, there are a few options. Um, there are automated payment uh, options, you know, such as Douala. You can obviously ACH your customers and your, your merchants. You can send paper checks to your merchants. Um, but the majority of sellers will go to the platform where they can get their money the fastest. More often than not, marketplaces are working with very small businesses who are dependent on a high level of cash flow. And so thinking about how you get their money to them is going to impact uh, your marketplace. And that's where we talk about when we kind of talk through the, the buyer and seller loop, you are between their customers and their money. And so it's a very important position to be in and you take that into consideration and you take that very seriously that relationship is, is very important. And so you wanna think about ahead of scale, how are you getting your merchants their money? And so whether you, you wanna be very consistent and thorough and thoughtful and maybe take a little bit more time, or if you wanna enable instant payouts, there are aspects and there are consequences of each one of those decisions, whether that's, you know, taking too long and, and the supplier and the merchant is, is getting frustrated that they're not getting their money faster, or if it's moving too fast and you're actually putting your merchant at risk of fraud and chargebacks, those are things that you need to take into consideration and, and really sort of think through as you, you build and scale um, your, your marketplace. I want to take a quick pause um, on the, the building the supply and bringing merchants into your marketplace and some of the considerations and just see if there are any, any questions.
so far. Don't be shy. Yeah, I, I think uh, everyone's uh, muted by um, by default. So you can uh, click on unmute yourself if you want or just uh, post in the chat and we can unmute you. Yeah. Okay. Feel free to stop me at any time. Um, thinking about the demand side, the people who are actually making payments on your uh, on your marketplace to your merchants, uh, this is where creating a community and, and thinking about how people interact with your brand specifically. Um, when you think about Etsy, you're not thinking about each individual merchant as a brand. You're thinking about Etsy and you're thinking about the community that it actually has built, the conversations that happen, the interactions that your merchants have with their customers. It's all facilitated on your platform. And so depending on the type of marketplace that you, you build, it's important to consider what kind of community you want to create and how your buyers and sellers are actually going to uh, interact with one another. You know, is it the sort of thing that you want to build a uh, almost a social media where people can also purchase items? Um, there's a, a marketplace out there, um, it's called Comment Sold, where it leverages the technology of Facebook and some of the NLP and natural language processing to actually promote transactions and people can buy and sell just through uh, a chat message. So there's a lot of different options that you have and you wanna consider um, when it comes to integrating your buyers and your sellers together. And it's a very important thing that does have a lot of impact on your platform and on your marketplace. Similar to the same conversation we were having about onboarding your merchants and onboarding your sellers, it's important that you also take into consideration the buyer experience. Because what happens if the experience is difficult, clunky, bumpy, inconsistent, or otherwise just absolutely non-existent, people are not going to buy from your marketplace. They're gonna to go to somewhere else where they can get a similar product. So if you, if you think and you're very cognizant about conversion rates on bringing your merchants onto your platform and to your marketplace, it's also very important to be cognizant of the people who spend money on your marketplace. So again, some of those things that most marketplaces overlook when they're getting started are design details, are specific coding decisions that they're making that they're not actually um, wanting to take on for one reason or another that do have a dramatic impact on conversion, on money flowing to your merchants. And we talked about the importance of being that go-between of your merchants and their money. Um, automating the process of checkout and, can, and helping customers understand if they have mistyped their credit card. Automating that process so that they don't have to go through and, and pay only to see, oh, I entered my credit card number wrong. I have to go through the entire process again. You know what, I'm just gonna come back later and I'll, I'll do this. You may just have lost a customer. So thinking about providing validation to that card number in real time significantly improves conversion rate. Thinking about autofill, most people have that thing that pops up in Google Chrome that says, do you wanna use this credit card, this credit card, or this credit card? Enabling that for your customers and for your customers' customers also has a dramatic Im impact on conversion rate. And some of the things that a lot of people just don't do is somewhat very simple. And so by enabling this for your customers' customers, you can impact conversion rate. And so it's, it's important to take these things into consideration because again, it provides that experience for the customer that is unique and delights them. This I can tell you is one of the most frustrating aspects of checking out on a mobile phone, which is the future. And I'm sure you've all seen this. How often do you have to use that tiny bar at the top of the keyboard to enter your credit card number? How much more time does that take to enter a credit card number when if you just automatically pull up the keypad, the conversion is much, much faster. People know how to type the, the numeric keypad a lot better. So taking this into consideration, taking all of these design aspects and some of these small nuances um, has a big impact on, on the experience for the buyer, 
and for the seller, as we saw when we're thinking about conversion and bringing merchants onto our platforms and into our marketplaces. Um, this is another one of those things that creates that conversation in your community. You know, you, you want to listen to your buyers and you want to listen to your sellers and some of the things that they're asking for, put it into, put it into effect, roll it out uh, and make sure that you're, you're actually um, following up on the things that you, you say that you're going to do. Hey, Bo, uh, quick question here. Uh, this is Levi. Um, a little hey, bit Levi. on kind of uh, automating the, the payout uh, for merchants. Um, could you could you talk a little bit, uh, you know, in this hypothetical of like, if you do say something like instant um, payout, but then the customer, you know, for some odd reason has a change of heart or whatever, and they issue a refund, you know, there's like some complexity that happens there of like, all right, well, then how do I get those dollars back that I paid out that I, I love to see if you could just uh, highlight a little bit. Thank you again. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, think of it this way. If if you process a transaction, um, the credit card companies, there is a, a delay from when the credit card company confirms that the transaction is completed. We think of it as instant, but in fact, there is a, a slight in between zero and two days from the time you push pay and the time you get that email that I just bought you know, a new pair of shoes the merchant doesn't actually receive a confirmed completed transaction until as many as two days later. That's even longer for ACH transactions. So if you're accepting ACH payments, that can be as long as seven days. So if you're thinking of paying your merchants instantly, what you're doing is you're putting yourself at risk that a charge, a change of heart could occur, that the customer could just request a refund right away. The customer could issue a dispute customer, uh, the transaction could fail, whether they have insufficient funds or something happens in that period. But if you've already made that payout, what you need to consider is how you communicate the fact that that merchant is now responsible for paying you as the marketplace back the funds that they have already withdrawn. And so whoever you partner with as your payment processor, you need to make sure you ask the process of, how do we get funds back if we've already paid it out? What is the mechanism that we're using to make sure that me as the merchant is made whole as, uh, you know, as, as that's going to impact your business? Because ultimately, you may or may not be aware, but the credit card companies are going to get their money. The banks are going to get their money. And so it's important for you to have a process and an open line of communication with your merchants of what that looks like if a customer issues or requests a refund or issues a dispute and a chargeback. Um, and so not only having that open line of communication, but also having a plan and a process of, of what happens if that, if that does occur. Awesome, thanks, Bob. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one other point off of that is the shifting of liability. Do you want the merchant to be responsible for issuing refunds and communicate directly with their customer? Or do you want to be in, in the middle of that? Um, you know, one of the interesting aspects about Etsy is that the, the refund policy is really non-existent. And most merchants actually don't provide issues uh, or provide refunds or returns. And that was a conscious decision um, on their part to limit the liability, but also to protect their merchants. You know, a lot of those merchants are craftspeople who have created a one-off item. And so it's very difficult logistically to sell something only to have it returned, um, you know, a month later or something like that. So it's a conscious decision that you need to make of what you want your marketplace to be like for both your buyers and your sellers. Again, taking into consideration that even though your credit card says transaction approved, you as the platform, you as the merchant, your customer, your merchants as the sellers, may not receive those funds until as, well, as many as two days later. Awesome. Anything else? Cool. I, I was gonna say, Bo, um, maybe, uh, I, I don't know if it's a good point to mention it now um, or maybe a little bit later, but uh, can you maybe speak to in the instances of, you know, uh, of, potential fraud or chargebacks, um, 
kind of like best practice and some of yeah. the tools that you guys provide yeah to reduce that sure um so you've you've probably all done your research as far as online fraud and it is increasing um you know it's it's easier today to buy something halfway around the world than it ever has been and as a result of that there is also it's easier today for people to commit fraud um, and so some of the things that you need to take into consideration is you want to um, you want to build in a tool that can identify fraud and you want to build in a tool that can prevent fraud from occurring um, if it does occur and it will and I don't want to be gloom and doom, but it will occur. You will get hit with fraud and a couple of fraudulent transactions here or there. It's not the end of the world, um, but you want to make sure that you are using a tool that has that either natively integrated or purchasing a third party software. Um, some of what that could look like is card testing. So let's say a fraudster purchases a list of 10,000 credit card numbers. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to go to several different websites in a very short period of time, either through a, a script or a bot that they have built, and just enter credit card numbers into checkout fields over and over and over again. And what that means is that the, the owner of that credit card doesn't know that their number has been compromised, but it's being used around the world in merchants' websites to check out and purchase product. Um, the impact that that has is number one, the customer, the consumer who owns that credit card is going to issue a dispute. I didn't make this purchase. It's fraudulent. My card was stolen. But also, and we think about instant payouts and, and shipping logistics, but there's also the cost of goods sold there. So you want to make sure that you have fraud considered and you want to be using a tool and a platform that helps you identify behavior of fraudsters oh, we've seen this card number 30 times in the last 10 minutes. Let's block this transaction because it's obviously being used to test to see if it's a valid card number. If the transaction is coming from an IP address that is halfway around the world from where the shipping address is, all of a sudden for the first time ever, that's an indicator of a fraudster. That's behavior that I'm not all of a sudden in Yugoslavia, I live in Oakland, California. All of my transactions should occur from a fairly small geographical radius from Oakland, California, not from Spain, not from Yugoslavia. So those are another, that's another indicator of, of potential fraud. So it's important that you take that into consideration when you're building your marketplace and it'll help your merchants feel confident that some transactions that should be valid may get blocked and they may get prevented, but that's really ultimately to protect you as the, the platform, as the marketplace, and as the merchant. I mean, and ultimately the consumer. Uh, because again, the banks are going to get their money, the credit card number, the credit card networks are going to get their money, and the consumer is going to get made whole again if fraud occurs on their card. Uh, because the, the banks and the credit card networks make money off of us using their credit cards. So they don't want to do anything that, that puts us in a, in a tough spot. So those are a couple of examples of fraud that we see. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different fraud out there. Um, and a lot of it is actually, uh, you know, we, we at Stripe try and um, be not intentionally vague, but we also try not to indicate too much of what we're looking for to tip off potential fraudsters so they know how to get around it. Um, those are things like transaction volume thresholds that automatically trigger a manual review. Those are things like location uh, tracking and, and geo-targeting from where the transaction is originating and where the shipping actually is, is being executed. Um, it's a lot of different things that you can do, but you, you need to consider as you're, you're building out and scaling your marketplace, um, particularly as you reach a certain size and, and threshold. Um, you know, Amazon is absolutely the target of a significant amount of fraud today just because of who they are. Uh, but as Etsy was really getting started, and they only had a few sellers on their marketplace. They weren't really on anybody's radar. And so it wasn't necessarily something that they were too concerned about, but they built it in early on. And as a result, they protected their merchants and they protected their buyers and have been able to scale because of it. Oh, super helpful insights, Bo. Could you name some of those third-party tools? You mentioned you could either natively integrate them or purchase some 
third party software tools. If, I was wondering if you could name some of those. Sure, sure, sure. Um, admittedly, I am a bit biased here, um, but uh, what, what we typically see is products called Signified, uh, something called Count. Um, I've seen Radar, which is Stripe's product, plug. Um, those three are the most commonly used. Um, what I would say is uh, they're all they're all pretty good in their own right. Um, you know, it's it's just up to you what is most important from an integration standpoint, but also capability standpoint, um, and and um, how much manual monitoring you actually want to do. So there's different levels of engagement for you as the marketplace of we're just going to set this and let the machine learning and AI do its thing because we trust it and it does work versus we're going to be very custom and we're going to spend a lot of time writing rules and doing reviews and things like that. So it's, it's a go between of how much time you want to spend building custom rules and managing manual uh, outcomes and things like that versus you know, machine learning and, and automating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I actually did just for the group, I actually did a, a screen share kind of video of radar for fraud teams that I use for studio time. So I'll share that in the uh, follow up for this too. So you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that definitely saved us. So um, is radar for fraud teams, Bo, is that something that, uh, you know, anyone that uses Stripe Connect uh, custom or, you know, signs up for it can have access to or? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, it, it is, so there's, there's two different offerings. Um, I, I don't want to go too far into the details here. There's two different offerings. There's a, a native platform that comes pre-integrated with any Stripe account and any Stripe connected account um, for your entire ecosystem and marketplace. And then there's a more advanced offering for what we were kind of talking about of like more manual oversight and, and granular integration. Cool, thanks. Anything else related to fraud, um, buy side, sell side? Sure, Bo, hi there, my name's Richard. Um, you know, uh, we tried out Braintree a, f a few years ago and we just found that, um, you know, mediating the transaction just opened up a, a huge amount of risk. Um, one scam that we saw was when the buyer and seller actually pose as the, are actually the same person and the buyer obtains this stolen credit card, makes the transaction, the payout then goes to the seller. And then, you know, a few weeks later, there's a charge back and the, um, you know, the, 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 the person's got their money and you know, they have a US bank account. This, so, so they walk away with 100% of the money, but they do a charge back and then we're responsible for 100% of the, the transaction fee when our cut was only going to be you know about 20 percent in the first place so mm -hmm. um you know, we just uh, kind of backed away from it and you know felt that mediating the transaction was just a very risky thing for a relatively smallish startup and we felt that you know an entire fraud team at least one or two people was necessary before we could you know transition and actually mediate the transaction so could you speak to that a little bit well, I, I think that that starts very early on in the conversation when you're onboarding your sellers um, and having a very comprehensive understanding of who they are and doing background checks on them. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, first of all, it's a requirement. Um, you know, you're, you're required to do a KYC and, and understand AML through all of the different sanctions and, and government bodies that you know, are part of becoming a marketplace. Um, I would say in your specific instance, it's, it's a difficult conversation because there's no, I mean, the right answer is to prevent fraud at all costs, um, but it's very difficult to catch things like this. Um, maybe I'm not understanding your question 100%. Um, are, are you asking how we have mediated instances like that in the past or how we advise marketplaces to kind of build out their fraud teams? You know, I think the latter really, I mean, you know, just really your general advice on, on you know, when, 
uh, you know, when you think it's feasible for a startup to mediate the full transaction, because, you know, we found that, you know, even with our team, um, um, you know, it's something that ne needs a team um, to keep an eye on. So I think really just the advice on, you know, when a startup's ready to mediate the transaction and, um, you know, the kinds of teams that they need, actually. Yeah. Um, a startup is ready to mediate a transaction when the the cost of losses due to fraud outweighs the money and revenue that you're actually pulling in um, versus the cost to pay somebody to actually manage it. And so some calculus needs to be done in terms of can we afford to pay a full-time risk analyst? Can we pay can we afford to pay a full-time customer support analyst to, to look at these transactions that are potentially risky and flagging the ones where behavioral indicators suggest that we should take a look at this transaction. Um, those are again things like is the uh, is the billing address vastly different than the shipping address? Mm -hmm. um, is the billing IP or is the device IP address far away or in is it far away from the actual shipping address? Um, is the is the card where it, it is the card somewhere where it shouldn't be? So it, it really comes down to whether or not you uh, are seeing a significant increase in fraud and you're mm -hmm. seeing a inc significant increase in losses and, and hiring somebody to do that for you versus just have a more kind of robust security system yeah. in place to block more transactions. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's tough. Uh, and, you know, as a startup grows, it, it can certainly have a, big impact early on um, because you don't want to impact conversion so much that it makes it difficult to buy, but you also don't want to make it so easy that anybody can just commit fraud. Sure. Um, to that, having a, a single system whenever possible and having kind of a, a simple way to view a transaction end to end across an entire network of transactions is valuable. Mm. Um, so the fewer, the fewer components plugged into one another, the better, because it's, it's separating the process, the payment process from the actual payout. It's separating mm. the onboarding process from the actual merchant and the actual transaction. And then we're separating even further the payout to the seller. So, whenever possible, limiting the number of steps it takes for a transaction to go through gives you better visibility end to end. Um, I mean, it, it's an unfortunate topic because it, it is going to happen. Um, and so it's, it's understanding what your tolerance and your acceptable fraud level is because, you know, there's a certain amount of it's just friendly fraud or it just is. Um, versus when it starts getting into dangerous territory, such as when like Visa and MasterCard start applying their match list. Uh, when you get to a certain threshold of disputes, I think it's above half a percentage mm. uh, where, where you start getting into very dangerous territory and you start needing to be even more stringent and strict on the type of transactions that you allow. Um, but I would, I would say it's, it's really, can you afford to pay somebody full time versus yeah. do you need a system that blocks transactions for you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the insights. Sure. I, hey, Richard, I can just uh, kind of speak to my experience with that because um, I faced a similar situation where it was, uh, we had in, an increase in fraud. Um, yeah. It was significant revenue as far as, you know, from uh, our commission from the GMB. And we used, uh, this isn't a light plug, well, obviously love Stripe, but uh, we use Radar for fraud teams. And I personally uh, spend a lot of time just understanding uh, what's possible uh, with it. So we um, had the, basically detecting uh, real time on the front end uh, uh, using, I think it was, I believe their kind of JavaScript kind of embed on the checkout. And then we did uh, 3DS, so 3D secure uh, for verifying credit cards. And then we really beefed up our rules. So you can create rules uh, basically saying like, hey, here's a list of you know, IP addresses we need to block and so forth. Yeah. Um, and that significantly reduced it. And I was actually able to manage that myself.
Really? Um, yeah, yeah. So I would definitely suggest checking that out. And then something else we did is we actually um, changed our kind of uh, policies as a marketplace. So we extended the payouts. So yeah. uh, we just gave ourselves a little bit longer duration after a completed booking um, just to mm -hmm. buy ourselves some buffer. So that way it, we would try to reduce uh, that instance also. No, I, th I think, Ben, I think um, folks have 90 days to, to do a chargeback. So, you know, in principle, they could wait for, you know, like 10 weeks and, and then, you know, weeks. For sure. Off. Yeah, for chargeback. But for unauthorized charges, typically a uh, consumer, if it's not their credit card and someone else actually uses it, what we saw in our use cases, that was fair, you know, that was fairly quickly. They would notify their bank. So, right. yeah. All right. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. It's pretty rare that a consumer will go 90 days without checking their statement. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's in your pocket now. It's available 24-7. Yeah. So um, chargebacks and disputes and, and fraudulent activity usually gets called out pretty quickly. So as, uh, as we're discussing, you know, that delay from when the charge actually goes through to when you pay out is an important consideration um, to help prevent some of that fraud. Um, but that's another good call out actually is the 3D secure um, is it's, it's not only required around Europe now um, through SCA, but it's an increasingly important mechanism to verify the buyer um, during the transaction process. So, you know, when you're, you're actually creating that transaction, having a second step to, you know, thumbprint, face scan, text code, something that verifies the buyer significantly helps you. And that's that's all technology that can be automated and, and will reduce the amount of headcount that you actually have to employ to have somebody manually look at your transactions. Um, and just as a minor plug, you do want to have a, a fraud platform that's easy to understand and it's easy to, to use. Thank you. Yeah. So all, all of this does go into the conversation about scaling globally, you know, and, and as you think about expanding your reach beyond the US into Canada, into LATAM, into Europe, and really everywhere and becoming ubiquitous, um, there are, in addition to fraud, there are considerations to localize the experience for both your buyer and your seller not only from a language perspective and, and um, naturalizing that onboarding language, but there are regulations country by country, region by region that you need to take into consideration when you're building out your platform and scaling it. So different countries are gonna have different requirements from a KYC and AML perspective. And those are always changing, they're evolving. And it's not changing in the standpoint of like every week there's a new regulation, there's a new law but it's important to be up to speed on what those are and understand what the implications are, um, the costs associated with it, uh, the requirements that you have to fill out and complete from your merchants as they onboard, the information that you need to continue to, to capture and, and uh, maintain. And then on the seller or on the buyer side, what is that experience gonna be like for them? You know, in the U.S., it's it's easy for us to say, well, credit card, that's that's the number one source of, of online transactions now. And it is. But around the rest of the world, that's not always the case. Um, you know, in, in Europe, particularly in the Netherlands, Ideal is a much more popular payment method. Um, over in, in China, Alipay, WeChat Pay, Union Pay, those are all aspects um, that you need to take into consideration as you're, you're expanding your, your reach and localizing those payment methods and, and providing that as a, a native experience helps conversion. Do you wanna present in the, the localized currency or do you wanna present in your currency as, as a US merchant, as a US marketplace? Um, do you wanna enable Apple Pay? Highly recommend you enable Apple Pay and Google Pay, whatever integration or payment processor you have, that is only going to continue to grow and that further introduces a layer of security for you. Just as an aside, um, Apple Pay and Google Pay have done a very good job of that. Um, so these are all things that, that you wanna take into consideration uh, and, and that uh, are very important um, as you build and, and scale internationally. Um, 
for your, both your merchants, but also the, the customers that are buying. Uh, any questions on expanding um, globalization? Some of, some of the things, this is more just a call out of kind of how confusing it can be. Um, this is not meant to be doom and gloom again or, or meant to scare you. This is more, uh, it's just important to do your homework. And it's important to understand all of the different parties and, and entities that are going to be involved as you, you start thinking about scaling internationally. Um, one of the, the biggest things is registering as a, a payfac or payment facilitator or uh, a money, uh, money services business, moving money from one side to another and obtaining your money transfer license. So if we could just throw some acronyms at you real quick, payfac, MSB, MTL. Those are three things that you need to consider and you need to, to think about the process, the cost, what impact that's going to have on your early days as you scale. They're all required. And, and if you're moving money from a buyer to a seller, you have to have some level of this. Um, background checks for your merchants, making sure you're doing KYC. Um, how do you manage your platform? How do you enable your your merchants to uh, manage their own finances and what tools do you provide for them? Do you wanna build something or do you wanna have something out of the box? Um, a lot of things to, to consider. Hey, sorry, Bo, um, I think we had uh, someone ask if you could repeat, if, uh, repeat the three acronyms, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, PayFAC, Payment Facilitator. You are facilitating payment from me, the consumer, to your merchant, the seller. MSB, money services business. You are in the business of managing somebody else's money, collecting it and distributing it. MTL is a money transfer license. That hereby declares you as a certified entity to move money from me, the consumer, to your merchant, the seller. Awesome, thank you. And then could you maybe speak to, let's just use an example of an early stage marketplace that signs up for Stripe Connect, uh, let's just say custom or standard, um, mm -hmm. or all, and they're operating in the US, or all three of those something that they're required? And if so, is that something that you guys provide? Advice? Yeah, yeah. All three of those things are required. Um, all three of those things are something that Stripe provides out of the box. We handle the compliance obligations. Now, there are other considerations depending on the type of marketplace that you are. Lyft, for example, they have additional obligations as far as KYC with the DMV and understanding driving records and background checks and history in that, right? We don't have any interaction with the DMV. We can't, you know, we can't say whether or not somebody's driving record is, is uh, valid for them to sell homemade pottery. That's just not something that we can do. Um, but we do provide the MTL, we do provide the, we, we are the MSB, and we are the PayFact. So we provide those three things and we check those boxes off for you when you sign up for, for Connect in any flavor, uh, whether that's standard, custom, or express. Cool. And then uh, I think we had a question that was uh, KYC, someone asked uh, what that stands for, um, which is a uh, know, know your customer. Um, <laughs> I believe, isn't there like, so the initial, the most basic form of onboarding a seller for payout information, is there a threshold that you, when they reach a certain amount, then you guys require uh, increased verification on that or? Yeah, um, that's a decision that can be made, uh, you know, in, to reduce onboarding friction and improve conversion. Um, you can choose to collect all of the required information up front at one time to uh, eliminate the need for a secondary follow-up to collect more information and just allow your seller to, to start selling and, and to start taking advantage of the marketplace and the community. Um, the alternative to that is to collect a bare minimum amount of information that just basically signs them up for a username and password. Um, they have to enter their bank account information. They have to enter... I think it's the last four digits of the social to do some identity verification, but it's it's not the more in-depth data collection. Um, we don't share the thresholds for what triggers a secondary follow-up for security purposes. And in, in most marketplaces, 
probably don't or shouldn't yeah. um, because that again, it tips off fraudsters and says, oh, well, as long as I stay below this, then I'm fine. I can just create another seller account and create another seller account and just commit fraud over and over and over again. Um, that's yes. going to be very... I was gonna, maybe that? I should maybe I should stop doing uh, videos on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that would be appreciated. Yes, yeah. um, I, I will say the threshold it does vary, um, and it is not a consistent line. Like it's not a, a linear thing. Of once you hit this, then we do that. It's it varies. And then also another question that uh, someone sent me uh, in the Slack um, was asking about. Um, uh, onboarding suppliers for payouts if they're an individual uh, versus a business entity? Mm -hmm. Just yeah. so using Stripe Connect and just maybe speaking to kind of how you guys handle that? Sure. Um, if well, I'll make this uh, uh, provider agnostic. Um, you wanna make sure that you are making it simple for the merchant to sign up. Um, you know, you, you don't want to confuse them by asking for their tax identifier or their EIN if they are an individual, um, because it's A, not required, and B, it, it could confuse them and it could ultimately lead to a drop off in conversion rates. And so what you want to take into consideration is how easy is it to delineate between I am an individual seller, I have a product, I am a sole proprietor, and I only want to provide you my information as the seller of Bo's Pottery. Right, or I am also a business, and I have, you know, logistics, and I have shipping, and I'm adding your marketplace as another selling channel for me. And so I'm providing my tax identification number, I'm providing my EIN, I'm providing my business information details, um, and being able to delineate that during the onboarding process significantly helps with conversion rates. And it is something that you do want to to, to consider. A gentle plug. Stripe does that automatically. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Anything else uh, on global expansion, onboarding merchants, conversion rates for the buyers? Um, specific examples, anything else? Um, yeah, I am based in Argentina. Most of my mm -hmm. sellers would be in Argentina. Most of my buyers would be um, foreigners. So I don't foresee a problem for, buy, uh, for buyers buying from my platform. The problem that I'm foreseeing is being able to pay my sellers uh, because Stripe and multiple uh, Stripe and PayPal and other currencies are not available in Argentina. Um, yeah, could you speak to that or yeah. anything that comes to mind? Um, I mean, the, the, the encouraging news there is that it is something that is coming. Um, we're not the only marketplace provider that is trying to break into the, the Latin American market. Um, I think we're a little further ahead than others, um, <clears throat> but we are trying to, to figure that out. The difficulty there is um, it's understanding the compliance and the regulatory landscape to productize it because it's, it's around the world, each country has its own operating principles to move money from one side to another. And so productizing how that's done and making it simple is how marketplace providers are able to scale at all. Um, you know, you can today go to the local banking entities and develop relationships and, and all of that. That's very difficult and time consuming in order to pay out your sellers. Um, so it is something that we've identified as a, an opportunity for us. And, and we are making inroads into uh, Argentina specifically and, and more broadly South America. Um, and so you know, more, to, more to come on that, I would say, stay tuned. Um, but it is, it, it is something that is, you know, it's similar to the, the fraud conversation. It's, it's a difficult one to have because we don't have a, uh, a good answer for it yet. Um, awesome. And follow-up question to that, because I plan to have sellers 
who are not based in Argentina, would we be able to have a, our platform um, that manually pays our sellers to Argentina and then automatically pays the sellers who are located in uh, countries where Stripe is supported? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's where you want to set up a, a, a system that handles payouts um, and that can automate that process based on the type of charge it is. Uh, there are specifics around how you capture the initial payment that dictate how the charge and how the payment will ultimately go to your seller. Um, it also has to do with you know where your platform physically is located and where the banking entity physically sits. Um, I think it's it's a it's a conversation we probably have offline um, for you specifically, um, but. I think you can, yeah, you can set it up so that you can pay people where Stripe is currently available today. Um, again, I don't, I don't want to make this a, a pitch about Stripe. I think it's more so how do we help? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I don't know if that was helpful or not. I, I apologize. Uh, no, it was, yeah, for sure. Any other questions? Cool. So if if I can impart sort of some, I guess, wisdom, quote unquote, um, on how to think about your marketplace as you, as you get started, be very focused um, in, in where you start um, and, you know, focus on what you want to sell and how you want to sell it. Um, focus on the experience for your marketplace or for your merchants. That is the lifeblood of your marketplace. And without merchants, there is no marketplace. So you want to make sure that you are very focused on providing them with a great experience. Um, then move into the, the buyer experience and, and provide them with a great experience. Um, but do your best to maintain focus on a few things that you can control up front. Don't try and do everything all at once. Don't try and layer in a whole bunch of fancy software and technology and um, don't, don't get sold. I guess, be very focused on what you want to accomplish and be very focused on what you want to, to do now and control the things that you can control. Um, focus on the seller experience. Like I said, they are your lifeblood. Without your sellers, without your merchants, there is no marketplace. Without drivers, there is no Lyft. Um, without artisans, there is no Etsy. So focus on, on that. Improve the, the checkout experience and make sure that it's easy for people to actually buy from you. Um, you know, a lot can be said, if there are no drivers, there is no lift, there are no riders, there are no drivers, there are no lift. So, you know, focusing on that and the downstream effects that making the supply side easy to expand very quickly helps the demand side expand very quickly to make it easy for everybody if, and control as best as you can what you can control. And then focus on localizing and customizing as you expand outward. Don't launch internationally very first thing. Be focused on the market that you want to focus on and, and you can control. Um, there's a lot to consider. And, and again, I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but there's a lot that can go wrong going too big too fast. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you have expanded and you've launched internationally and now all of a sudden you're having to deal with fraud around the world. Um, and, and trying to focus on things that you, you really could have controlled and learned early on um, just by going too fast. And find somebody, whether that's a legal counsel, whether that's somebody that has done this before, whether that is a tech partner um, that knows the ins and outs and can help you look around corners, but find somebody that's an expert in this regulation. Um, too much can go wrong by filling out the wrong form or just not completing something uh, that, that was fairly simple. So make sure that you're, you're understanding what obligations you have. As I mentioned with the example of Lyft, we handle the, the KYC as far as them, as the driver being a, uh, a, a merchant, so on, or so to speak. But they have additional obligations that require them to adhere to um, additional safety precautions, additional background checks from the drivers and the DMV. 
Stripe will help you meet certain obligations, but there is likely or possibly additional requirements and regulations that you have to meet. So it's important to understand what those are um, and, and, and understanding and getting a partner that can help you with that process. So in closing, congratulations and, and good luck. Uh, this is a really exciting space and, and I think you all wouldn't be doing this if it weren't. Um, you know, there are a million and one resources out there to help you, help you scale, help you grow, help you answer questions. Um, don't be afraid to answer or to ask questions. There are no silly questions. Uh, and, and the cost of not asking a question is far greater than getting a repetitive answer. Uh, so uh, thank, I mean, thank you for, for joining uh, and, and giving me the opportunity to, to share some of my experience and, and how we think about things. Um, and good luck. Awesome. Thanks, Bo. Um, do we have like maybe a few minutes if there's any kind of last questions or? Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. That was really great though. Hi everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mike, for your leadership in helping us uh, grow and succeed in our marketplace. I really, really appreciate you, your leadership. Thank you very much both for for, um, uh, first of all, I'm Serge Label from Montreal. My business partner is Yuko Nakamura from Japan. Um, uh, just to contextualize, uh, um, I'm a former employee of Cirque du Soleil. And as you know, Cirque du Soleil has closed and uh, thousands of artists are jobless right now. And if you look at what Airbnb has done with Airbnb experience, uh, more and more artists are starting to, to share their skills and their talent to, to the world. Uh, it's going to be very hard for us not to go internationally since, uh, first of all, the suppliers are worldwide and the eventual buyers will be worldwide. So <laughs> I'm a little bit uh, worried if this is going to be, and I truly appreciate what you said, Bo, about the different kind of payments and stuff like that. We're not techie, we're not, we're not system payment kind of person. Supply is absolutely not a problem for us. Demand is not a problem for us. And we managed to create in a, in a record time a marketplace using a share cry. And uh, we're ready. We're, we're about to launch uh, very soon. And so my question was, uh, how, uh, it's difficult to localize it because there's going to be this uh, Russian acrobat and there's going to be this Argentinian uh, 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 juggler or this Japanese uh, uh, contortionist. So, and the buyers will come from all over the world. So I, I'm trying to make sure that we uh, we don't fall into the, uh, the the problems that you've described uh, so accurately uh, Bo. yeah I, I didn't I, I guess maybe I didn't mean to say don't start internationally that was certainly not my I, I don't mean to dampen any any uh, aspirations I, I, I want you to be cognizant of the things that go into expanding internationally right away um, and when I say you find a partner that understands regulations, that can be the marketplace provider or the software provider that you that you ultimately choose. Um, I, I don't, you know, again, I, I don't want to plug too much, um, but we do have all of those things as you kind of bring your marketplace onto Stripe, productize, um, and as you onboard Russian acrobats. Argentinian jugglers, Japanese contortionists, you know, we, we, we know how to do the background checks and we know how to bring them on safely as sellers. So you want to find a platform that, that can help you with that. And we're not the only one, I'm not naive to that fact, but, um, you know, certainly understanding what the platform offers from a compliance standpoint as you think about onboarding sellers mm -hmm. and understanding whether or not it meets your obligations and what additional obligations that you have. 
two things that I think that I think will will really really help us, and you 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 said it perfectly. Is uh, I, I'm a strong believer of uh, nailing it be, before scaling it. Yeah, uh, I come. I come from Olympic sports, so do your the fundamentals, and then you'll think about the Olympics. So, so this is very important, and uh, I think that uh, uh, being extremely focused on what you're providing in terms of, of, in our case, of content. That's why we just want to focus on circus artists. We're not going to have singers, DJs, and so on. So we will. We really, really want to work on uh, uh, focus on something that. First of all, I master, and um, so th those are the two key uh, uh, key um, take uh, take take out from uh, from our discussion. Thank you so much, Bo, and good luck for everybody. Awesome, thanks. Um, I think uh, Dan, did you sit in the chat? Did you have a question? Yeah, it's not a real specific one. First of all, that was really interesting about the Cirque du Soleil. I'm using Cirque Tribe for a live appearance um, video. Uh, uh, so maybe we should chat afterwards and compare experiences. I'm live. Um, I have had customers, my, my marketplace is live author appearances, professional authors doing live uh, ticketed events, Zoom events. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had some authors who have balked when they get to uh, setting up their Stripe account. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of them, you know, have had their own personal experiences with identity fraud or something, just are hesitant to do that. But um, I've tried to sort of identify at what point in setting up their Stripe that they sort of stop. And I think it's sort of at uh, when they're entering their business details. Um, based in the United States, so I, I, I'm not real familiar with other uh, other questions that might be in it at that point. But can you just talk a little bit about what goes into editing or creating your business details? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's a requirement for us to provide that information to do the background check. And so we, we have to capture that information. Where merchants typically get uncomfortable or they're just a little more wary is we're not a household name to most consumers. We don't necessarily, I mean, at some point we're going to be, but we don't necessarily want to be consumer facing. And so, you know, if you run a business, you may or may not have heard of us. You probably heard of us, but if you're a small independent business or, or you really haven't moved into payment processing at all, you don't know who Stripe is. And they're going to you as, as Dan and to your marketplace as I want to sign up for this. Why am I being redirected to this? This, this doesn't make sense to me. And I'm, I'm cautious about online fraud and I'm cautious about this and that and the other thing. This is where communication is really, really important with all of your sellers and conveying that message of we use Stripe to process your payments. Here's why we use Stripe or any provider for that matter. Here's why we use uh, Stripe. Here is where you can get more information. Here is where you can reach out to answer, to ask questions um, and, and providing just transparency and just letting them know that we are one of the, and actually I'm gonna start selling here. I'm gonna stop myself. Um, letting them know the process upfront and what that looks like and, and letting them know um, that you have their security and best interests in, in mind. And you've taken the steps to have their security and their best interests in mind. Um, and when people know what information is going to be expected of them, it's not necessarily a stop in the middle of the process and go, well, wait a minute, why do I need my tax ID number? I'm not, I'm not signing up for a loan. I'm signing up to get customers so that I can provide a, a, an experience. Um, being upfront, being transparent and being very communicative about why you chose the platform you chose to process their payment and how it's all gonna work. That's, that's, a, that's a great way to remove the friction upfront uh, for the, the sellers who are cautious or more reticent to just provide that information. 
Um, and again, as a Stripe user, you can get more information about how we treat their details and you can provide that. To them. Just as a follow-up of that, I, I entered, I created an FAQ on my site, you know, should my users get, go venture, you know, navigate to the FAQ when they hit that point. Yeah. And uh, is there a place on your website or is there somebody I can talk to who can take a look at my FAQ and maybe make some suggestions to help me with with that? Um, we, we try and stay away from offering guidance in that way. Um, only because it uh, we, we don't want to offer misinformation and we don't want to offer you know the wrong information what was that sales point that you stopped yourself from making stripe is the <laughs> forester forester just released a report i'll, I'll just say that um and so we we try and and uh stay away from advising too much in terms of potentially legal matters I know FAQ is not like a legal document or anything like that, um, but as it pertains to Stripe specifically, any any information you can you can find on our website and, and you can reach out to support or I'm, I'm sure Mike or you know even myself can can kind of point you in the right direction there. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, because sometimes getting the verbiage really specifically correctly can give yeah. users a lot of confidence. Yeah. yeah. Dan, Dan, maybe uh, maybe after it's kind of like a follow up in the group or something on our office hours, we can uh, take a look at some like best practice from other marketplaces too. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Cool. Do we have uh, any other la last questions? I think we're uh, running out of time here. Yeah, just a bit over. That's okay. Cool. Well, yeah, well, let's just, uh, let's just wrap it up then. Cause I think we, uh, covered quite a bit. So, um, yeah, once again, but really appreciate it. And, uh, thanks Megan too, um, for, for, you know, first off supporting the group and uh, making this possible. So really appreciate it. And I know that, uh, we all got a lot of help out of it. Yeah. So cool. All right. Thank, thanks everyone for, uh, thank you, Bob. thanks everyone thank for Mike. joining in and, uh, yeah, I'll share this in Slack as a uh, follow up with some resources and whatnot. So, all right. Yeah, thank you so much, Bo and Mike. See ya.